In 2021, the world was just starting to emerge from its COVID-19 fog, and it spent a lot of time locked indoors getting weird. Sourdough and Tiger King weird. I consider that bitch to be one of the biggest terrorists in the exotic animal world right now. This was the first pandemic that took place during the social media era, allowing people to experience a modicum of sociality while maintaining social distance. And what that meant in a TikTok, YouTube, Instagram live world is that we spent a lot of time looking at other people performing for us. Imagine all the people living for today. This exacerbated an already burgeoning problem of trust among people raised on social media, and that's reflected in the media produced during and after the pandemic. But it reaffirmed something we already knew about American society. We like to watch. We're looking deep into this one, so there are bound to be some spoilers. And if you have a favorite thriller to share, post it in the comments. The technical term for the joy of watching others is scopophilia. Sigmund Freud, because of course it's Sigmund Freud, it's me, bitches. linked scopophilia to childhood development as children try to observe and understand relationships and sexuality. We understand scopophilia a bit differently now, but since Freud's theories were contemporaneous with the birth of cinema as an art form, they heavily influenced the language of cinema, and that language persists to this day. It's the same way that the etymology of lunatic implies that mental illness is tied to the moon, but even after we discovered better explanations, the word still persists. Eventually, Freud said, we modify our scopophilic tendencies into more socially acceptable forms, or sublimation. Art appreciation, for example, allows us to indulge in a healthy amount of voyeurism without social consequences. And although cinema didn't become an art form until the latter half of Freud's life, it did become a panacea to satisfy our desire to peer into others' lives. If those desires aren't satisfied, we engage in repression, leading to feelings of guilt, anxiety, and unfulfillment. We fear being ostracized from our community because of our desires, and we feel shame for having the desire to look in the first place. This can lead to a distortion in our thought processes and the way we conceptualize our place in the world. These anxiety-provoking thoughts and negative self-judgment are part of what literary critic Eve Sedgwick calls paranoid gothic. The paranoid gothic subgenre cranks up the fear factor in traditional gothic literature by amplifying anxieties and suspicions. Characters become fixated on unseen threats, constantly suspecting everything and everyone around them. Unreliable narrators and blurring lines between reality and delusion further fuel the paranoia. This intense mind game, often intertwined with conspiracies and internal struggles, creates a unique and unsettling experience for the audience. While sharing some core elements with traditional gothic, the paranoid gothic specifically focuses on the psychological torment and distorted perceptions of its characters trapped in a web of their own anxieties. Sedgwick primarily refers to the traditional gothic novels of the 18th and 19th centuries, but as we discover more about the complexities of gender and sexuality, the framework applies to power, identity, and the construction of sexuality in a heteronormative society. It's important to recognize, though, that the concepts of heterosexual and straight have slightly different meanings for theorists of queer studies, but it also comes down to common sense. Historically, it was difficult to find overtly queer characters in literature. Authors generally had to imply through language, narrative, and illusion the presence of queerness. As a result, heterosexual came to mean the sexual attraction to people of another sex, while straight refers more to the reinforcement of social norms. You know, they say a woman's place is in the home, and uh, I suppose as long as she's in the home, she might as well be in the kitchen. Huh. And the social norms at the time the terms heterosexual and homosexual were invented demanded that sex be solely between a married man and a woman for the purposes of procreation. So oral sex could be heterosexual, but because it wasn't for procreation, it just wasn't straight. It's the whole a square is a rectangle, but a rectangle isn't necessarily a square thing. For theorists like Sedgwick, Laura Mulvey, Lauren Berlant, and Judith Butler, because straightness is more about social norms than it is about who's having sex with whom, media that feature heterosexual characters breaking social norms can still be valuable for understanding queer identity. Queerness then can encompass multiple non-conforming acts, including fetishes and scopophilia. In fact, in her book The Epistemology of the Closet, Sedgwick ties scopophilia directly to queerness, with the act of looking feeling empowering, but guilt and shame of objectification prompting anxiety. In other words, we like to watch, but we certainly don't want to be watched by others without our consent. And that dichotomy of our joy producing someone else's shame causes us to feel guilty about looking. Enter Michael Moen, 
the writer-director of 2021's The Voyeurs. It might be too early to say that Moen's oeuvre has a strong thematic coherence, but you do notice things. As co-creator of the Netflix comedy Everything Sucks, and the writer-director of comedy dramas Pink Grapefruit and Save the Date, Moen's stories often center around sexuality in a way that correlates with queer narratives. And they typically tend to involve Sidney Sweeney, who seems to be Moen's muse. It's probably no coincidence that Sweeney's star was on the rise during the pandemic as well. Sweeney, whose awkward charm made her an affable regular in Moen's Everything Sucks, became a sex symbol after being featured in HBO's Euphoria and The White Lotus. Euphoria in particular traded on Sydney Sweeney's body while providing just enough dramatic cover for the I swear I'm just invested in the characters crowd. That seems to be a common theme for this generation of Hollywood it girls. The same requirement to approach physical perfection that we've always had for leading actresses, but plausible deniability for the audience that the joy of looking at sexually attractive people is why we require it. It's Jennifer Lawrence. They told me not to do a game show, but I was like, screw it, I can have fun, I'm a regular person. <laughs> In a post-Me Too movement, we're morally aghast at objectification, but we're covertly aroused by it, bringing us back to Freud's theories on repression. It's me, bitches. In her article, Everyone is Beautiful and No One is Horny, Raquel Benedict dissects the ways post-9-11 cinema has decoupled sex from eroticism. Actors strive for rippled muscles and tight cleavage, but not in order to be sexually appealing, in order to defeat the enemy, which in the immediate post-9-11 environment was radical Islamists, but shifted on a dime to become some vague notion of wokeness. And this divorce from sexuality isn't a form of sublimation, it's repression. And it causes our sexual desires to come out in strange and unhealthy, irony-poisoned ways. For his part, Moen has stated that he wanted the voyeurs to be an antidote to that, to bring back the erotic thrillers of the past. I wanted to make a movie that was really sexy. Erotic thrillers in cinema have largely disappeared since Adrian Lyne's Unfaithful which made millions in profit and scored an Oscar nomination for lead actress Diane Lane. And while that film's success led to a much needed lane it didn't do much to fuel a resurgence in adult thrillers. Most recent erotic thrillers that have seen the light of day, like Fifty Shades of Grey, Netflix's You, and Hulu's Deep Water, do so because they had a built-in audience already. The Voyeurs was intended to be the first in a series of Amazon sexy date night films that would recall those erotic thrillers of the 1990s. But Amazon unceremoniously pulled the plug on that idea, despite the voyeurs being one of their most profitable endeavors. The result is a peon to the De Palma era that treats voyeurism with a wide-eyed innocence in the first half, only to abruptly shift to something resembling an EC Comics revenge drama in the final act. I guess revenge is in the eye of the beholder. <laughs> for better or for worse, Moen's narrative mirrors the way we objectify a woman after Me Too. She has to be the most fuckable woman at Whole Foods, but she can't be so sexy as to be unattainable. So she also has to be a manic pixie trash goblin who can't hold it together because it turns out that finding a man who went to therapy and developed big golden retriever energy just wasn't as fulfilling as TikTok promised. Sometimes I feel like everybody is a sexy baby. And so it goes with the two lead characters of the voyeurs. Pippa and Tom, portrayed by Sweeney and Justice Smith. And yes, the two lead characters in a story about peeping are named Pippa and Tom. But not everybody will get that. That's just for the scholars a hundred years from now. They're a charming couple just starting out who lucked into an impossibly high-end loft. She's an ophthalmologist, so it's actually Dr. Pippa. And he's a music and sound engineer, so they can probably afford the rent. It's just lucky they found it. It's also worth noting that if they're both in their mid-twenties just starting out, she's probably making two to three times what he's pulling down, making her the breadwinner of the relationship. It's not just in the bank account where Tom can't keep up with Pippa either. On their first night in the apartment, Pippa wants to break it in with sexy time, but Tom has already fallen asleep. And that transformation from sweats to lingerie is not exactly a short haul, so you can imagine her frustration. Pippa and Tom's life is shown in contrast to the irretrievably horny neighbors across the street. He's a photographer and she's a model, and they put on a show for the neighborhood newbies in more ways than one. Pippa debates rear window ethics with her co-worker Ari, who is all in favor of pulling up a chair and watching a good healthy boink fest. I'm 1000% wrong about that. It is entirely acceptable to look. I mean, it sounds like they're exhibitionists. Moen does a fine job of driving home the theme in the first act. In fact, he beats you over the head with it so you can't miss it. But contrary to what your film professor might tell you about making everything subtextual, there's nothing wrong with having a demonstrated sense of purpose in your text. Throughout the first act, Pippa and Tom treat their neighbors, whom Pippa has named Brent and Margot, 
less like people and more like media to be consumed. And the neighbors gratify a number of media consumption habits for Pippa and Tom. For example, their friend group treats them like an episode of Real Housewives as they speculate about their relationship status after seeing Brent having sex with another woman. They give their neighbors the MST3K treatment it's -a me, Mario. Until Brent starts choking on a tuna roll, at which point they turn into a movie theater audience, yelling at the screen for the characters to do something and feeling a sense of accomplishment and connection when they influence Margot to save Brent's life. Pippa also gets up late at night to lust over her neighbor's body, and she and Tom have sex while watching the neighbors as if they were watching porn together. It's like the neighbors are a substitute for a television. They broadcast a lot of different content, you just have to be home at the right time. This is where moral mission creep starts to rear its ugly head. Even though it's somewhat played for laughs, Tom is reluctant to interfere when they see Brent choking. But Pippa demands he run across the street to save him, even though it will expose them as peepers. They'll know that we were spying. Yeah, but then he won't be dead, go! Shit. But Pippa and Tom have been inching from passive to active voyeurism the whole time. And this is where the already existing tears in the relationship start to fray even further. When they first arrive, Tom jokes that he wants to take up the accordion. And on her way home from work, Pippa happens upon an accordion in an antique shop. Instead, though, she buys the binoculars behind it so that they can spy more closely, putting her desires ahead of doing something fun for Tom. Their sex life is also starting to falter. Pippa guides Tom into sex as she's watching Brent, but the sex isn't as gratifying as she'd hoped. And it leaves Tom apologizing for his too soon orgasm and her playing the role of caretaker for his feelings. It's okay, why are you apologizing? <laughs> By the end of the first act, we get the sense that Pippa is getting pulled deeper into voyeurism and getting pulled further away from her normal relationship with Tom. In other words, getting pulled further away from straightness and sinking deeper into queerness. And by the start of the second act, they're not only watching their neighbors, whose real names are Sebastian and Julia by the way, they're listening to their conversations thanks to a brazen party crash in which they planted a bug. And again, as if the metaphor isn't driven home hard enough, Pippa erases the chalk drawing of Pippa and Tom to help fix their complex listening system. It's not subtle! You might think it stretches the metaphor a bit, but when I first watched the film, the first thing I thought of watching Tom's uneasiness around Pippa's increasingly obsessive behavior was the guys who introduced the idea of an open relationship to their wives or girlfriends, only to have it backfire in a big way when their partners are much better at navigating relationships than they are. Tom thought it was cute at first, even above Pippa's objections. We are officially being creepy weirdos, don't no, you agree? What? They, they want us to look. But then she got way more into it than he did. Are we bad people for watching this? No. This fear that men have over unrestrained female sexuality is touched upon in Barbara Creed's The Monstrous Feminine. For men, because our identity is so wrapped up in masculinity, and our masculinity is so wrapped up in our sexual prowess, sexually empowered women become frightening. Um, he's kissing her neck, and what are we doing this real quick? If we were to reverse engineer our way out of that rabbit hole, a woman who seeks sexual gratification from someone other than us questions our sexual prowess, which threatens our masculinity, which negates our identity as men. Am I not enough for you? In other words, the experience is castrating. Creed adopts Freud's use of the term fantasy here to refer to monstrous images of women in cinema, and in her book, she refers to actual monsters. But for men, the idea of being around a highly sexual woman who simply doesn't want you is orders of magnitude more scary than one that's threatening to eat you. To recall Freud, if you opt to deal with your desires by repressing them, they're gonna come out in weird ways. Think of fantasy like a homegrown intrusive thought that you cultivated yourself, but it metastasized and grew out of control. Until you satisfy the urge, until you scratch that itch, it will continue to come back unconsciously. The moral ante gets upped when Julia walks into Pippa's office for an incredibly intimate eye exam, and this is where the gaze gets disrupted. Pippa, and by proxy the audience, no longer have the safety and power of distance. Julia can see Pippa. Honestly, on a scale of 1 to 10, how freaked out would you be if you were watching Succession and Shiv just turned and started talking to you? I'm not talking about just breaking the fourth wall here, but actually commenting on your furniture and your DoorDash egg rolls and your yummy sushi pajamas. You'd probably duck behind the couch so you couldn't be seen. That's the difference between being an object and a subject. An object is looked at, but a subject does the looking. And the more you're used to being the voyeur, the more jarring it is when the object of your gaze looks back at you. The women bond over a schwitz, which just makes Pippa's moral conundrum more pronounced. 
She knows that Sebastian is cheating, but how can she tell Julia without letting her know how she came by that information? It's here where Pippa reveals her fatal character flaw. When you're so obsessed with something that you forget to pick your head up and look around and go, oh wait, what am I even doing? She's been so straight, in the cultural sense, that she never bothered to explore herself. I want to wake up Sunday morning with an awful hangover that reminds me of all the terrible decisions I made the night before. Becoming who she is and settling down with a career and a partner killed off all the potential Pippas that could have been. And since she did it so young, she never got to live an unfettered life. At this point, it's important to note that Moen's transitions often include shots looking in at all the other neighbors. There's a family, an arguing couple, and a guy who's really into fitness. These are all examples of people living disparate, full lives, all unique experiences. In the same way that all of the couples across the way in Rear Window represent different possible outcomes for Jeff and Lisa. And Pippa, being filled with the disorienting feelings of unearned regret and shame, would obviously lead her to explore other people's lives vicariously as a means to make up for her own siloed existence. For his part, Tom is out by now. The situation is too morally complex, and Pippa is wrapped up so deep that she's not even present in the relationship any longer. She's lost in a Freudian fantasy where her mind is constantly with Julia and Seb. Pippa is so fixated that she feels a moral obligation to tell Julia that Seb is cheating, which would return her to the nice, straight life that she had before and she could focus on Tom. But of course she doesn't do that because this is a paranoid gothic tale and Pippa can't admit who she is yet. Instead, she sends anonymous messages to Julia's printer that expose Sebastian's adultery. This has the unintended consequence of, spoiler alert, driving an already depressed Julia over the edge to the point where she slits her wrists in the bathroom. Tom blames Pippa for Julia's death and ends the relationship for real. You ended that fucking woman's life! And Pippa's life starts to fall apart. This is, of course, a stark contrast to what happens in similar films like Rear Window, where the message is you should probably snoop on your neighbors because one of them might be a murderer. Interesting how that message was embedded as McCarthyism was just ramping up. And more interesting still is this film's message that the common person probably shouldn't try to interfere, even if it is to save other people's lives. And this comes after a decade of Marvel movies. Isn't that the mission? Isn't that the why we fight so we can end the fight so we get to go home? With Seb and Pippa now single, we get the scene that probably brought most viewers to the table, and that's the erotic part of the erotic thriller. Sebastian spies Pippa watching him at the local bar and proceeds to seduce her with a line of pretentious guy in his first year of philosophy class bullshit about how masturbation and adultery are moral equivalents, and how he's pouty because none of his lovers have transcended morality at his pace enough to understand that. Not everyone agrees with you. No. I don't. He also incorrects her about her own story when she tells him the fable of the ass and his masters as a parable about being happy with what you have. He tells her that the fable was actually invented by Aesop to keep his slaves in line so that they wouldn't think about freedom. And Pippa's degree is in an actually lucrative field so she doesn't know enough to tell him that there's little evidence that Aesop ever owned slaves because there's little evidence that Aesop actually existed. Anyway, Pippa was already down to fornicate, so it seems nothing he says is off-putting enough to dissuade her. And this is set up by Pippa's dire need to be someone other than the I picked out my career path in third grade Pippa, as she currently lives her life. When in reality, you were just deeply, deeply repressed. I want to wake up Sunday morning with an awful hangover that reminds me of all of the terrible decisions I made the night before. Would it be strange if I asked to take your picture? And because Sebastian looks like Ben Hardy. And the way Moen directs the scene tells us that Pippa briefly allows herself to be seduced out of guilt over Julia's death, but she stops in the middle, gathers her thoughts, and then takes control, which is what she always wanted. Go get a gun. Unfortunately, when Pippa returns home, she finds Tom dead by apparent suicide after having seen her across the street with Sebastian. So the tragedies continue to pile up. This is also, I think, where most viewers tend to part ways with the film mentally and emotionally, as the film goes from something attempting commentary on voyeurism to an outright Tales from the Crypt episode. Pippa attends Sebastian's exhibit, where the shocking twist is revealed that Pippa is the exhibit. Julia is very much alive, and this has all been a sort of immersive voyeuristic experience in which the voyeur is the object that the audience is looking at. 
There were cameras set up in Pippa and Tom's apartment. They were under constant surveillance. And the story that played out in front of them, which was controlled by Seb and Julia the entire time, is built into the narrative. And all of this is apparently legal because Pippa signed a consent agreement along with the lease without actually reading it. Julia and Seb become the toasts of the art world, trading on their newfound reputations as provocateurs, and even embracing Tom's death with a you can't make a Tomlet without breaking a few Greggs attitude. But that's not the final twist. Pippa realizes that Tom didn't kill himself when she finds his gross health drink in the bird feeder and about half a dozen dead birds on the fire escape. Turns out he was poisoned and made to look like he died by suicide. So Pippa plays the reverse Uno card and drugs Julia and Sebastian just long enough to be able to fry their corneas out and make the voyeurs blind. Obviously, a lot of this film rides on the shoulders of Sidney Sweeney, who has to convey a goofy sense of charm with subtle hints of OCD, and then full-blown fixation without losing the audience. And for the most part, she carries the film. She's funny and somewhat awkward throughout, before the film turns on a plugged nickel and she has to turn into Maxim Magazine Sidney Sweeney. And the casting of Sweeney is central to the success or failure of this film, not just from a marketing perspective, but from a paracanon perspective. Sidney Sweeney is probably one of the most gawked at celebrities of the past four years, outside of Taylor Swift, leading to her getting slut shamed about her co-star, body shamed off of TikTok, and Trump shamed about her father's politics. And this doesn't even take into account the myriad of people who have probably gone through her euphoria nude scenes like they're the Zapruder film. So retrospectively, Sydney Sweeney is the perfect casting for this part. You guys can all judge me if you want, but I do not care. I have never, ever been happier. Where Sweeney and Moen go wrong, though, is abandoning what worked so well in the first hour or so of the film. And that's the banality of obsession. What makes films like Rear Window, Body Double, and When It Works, The Voyeurs successful is that the voyeuristic characters and the audience both share a love for looking at intimate things. And if you're thinking, well, not me, not to that extent, yes, you too. That's what a movie is. You're in the room watching people who are having conversations and don't know that you're there. You have no business being there, Susan. The audience goes along with Pippa through most of the film because we also want to know what's going on over there. And every morally questionable step Pippa takes gets us more information. So we're okay with that. I think the reason everything after the sex scene fails, because trust me, it's not that either of these people are poorly photographed, is because of the restaurant scene immediately preceding it. Sib's game comes across as a strained combination of Jimbo Jones and Robin Thicke. And Pippa just has to sit there through his cringeworthy version of the mystery method, with her big Sidney Sweeney eyes like a deer in the headlights. What would have kept the film thematically consistent is if Pippa's obsession had continued in this scene, and she had been the aggressor, manipulating her way into having that drink with him. And Sweeney's decision to give a subtle, serious performance in the final act also doesn't help. The script goes full camp at the end, and it deserves a Cassie Howard-level performance that drives home just how corrosive obsession can be. Pippa is someone who has it all, and she should be content, according to our culture anyway. But she clearly has a lack in her life. I finally achieved the one thing that I've worked years and years to do, and in the process, I kind of killed off all possibilities of something else. Which causes an unspoken desire that only voyeurism can fill. And even if she does love Tom, and she does love her job, wondering what could have been, like being one of Sebastian's many fuck toy models, does intrigue her. And because she feels guilty about not being content, she doesn't allow herself to acknowledge the discontent, and it leaks out in self-destructive ways. It's this reaction to a feeling of queerness, of non-straightness, where the film is at its most successful. And it's this idea that Sedgwick focuses on in her book, Tendencies. So many people of varying sexual practices too, enjoy incorrigibly absorbing imaginative, artistic, intellectual, and effective lives that have been richly nourished by queer energies, and that are savagely diminished when the queerness of those energies is trashed or disavowed. Sedgwick's work frequently goes back to the idea of the closet, and how repression of nonconformist sexual identities can often lead to a distortion of reality. Pippa's repression means she's not able to see straight, no pun intended. And she admits as much to Julia. It's like when you're so obsessed with something that you forget to pick your head up and look around and go, oh wait, what am I even doing? 
And all of this manifests in her tendency to project her own relationship insecurities onto Sebastian and Julia before she even knows them. And this is after a number of attempts to force a straight, normal relationship with Tom, which just comes across as overcompensating. Unfortunately, the film's thesis gets blurred by the end, just as Sedgwick predicted it would in a mainstream film like this. The moments that subvert a male gaze and even attempt to establish a female gaze are run over by the locomotive that is our need to leer at Sidney Sweeney naked. And so the provocative voyeurism theme is traded in for a much more standard Sydney Sweeney boobs hot sex scene euphoria bikini blonde oral woman on top Pornhub clip fodder. Unfortunately, the film doesn't wind up paying off the subversion that it starts, as Pippa is punished for her transgressive looking and literally leaves her broken binoculars behind in the final shot. But I do think the film does get better and more valuable as Sydney Sweeney's star grows, and it's worth a second look for those who wrote it off as streamer trash, especially for those first two acts because Sweeney's performance and Moen's script perfectly captures Sedgwick's idea of the modern paranoid gothic and the problems that can arise in the repression of desire. It's obviously more subtle than in films like The Number 23, The Others, or Shutter Island, but Pippa's reality becomes distorted as she's torn between her obsession with experiencing another life and the societal pressures to conform to a career, a nice place, and a monogamous relationship. And that's an intriguing theme for a movie sold to us as just another erotic thriller. Stay warm, stay safe, close your blinds at night, return your shopping carts, and I'll see you next time.